The second generation of the town car was Lincoln's attempt to really exploit all of the potential luxury out of this platform. However, they obviously don't make cars like these anymore. So today I'm gonna try to find out if that market shift was the right call. And I'll also show you why I think this is one of the most special cars I've gotten the chance to review. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell. That way you get great reviews and I get closer to making this my full-time job. Thank you, now back to the review. The second gen town car debuted for the 1990 model year and it was called the FN 36 generation or later years the FN 116. The one that I have here is in 97. So these cars received a refresh in the 95 model year. This refresh brought slight refinements on the outside like this grille and more squinty headlights, but the major changes were left for the interior. Before we continue, I'd like to thank Royal on the East Side for giving me this mostly mint town car for my review. If you're looking for something new, used, or just plain cool, check them out. The flat faces of the front end here do a better job at mimicking 80s vibes than Stranger Things, and the Lincoln is ridiculously long at 219 inches. I mean, that's the footprint of a Chevy Suburban. And the hood is comically massive. Whenever you're driving it, it feels like a uh, long barrel shotgun or something. You have the, the little Lincoln badge up there that feels like a little sight. It's one of the many aspects of this vehicle that makes it just so different from anything produced in the past decade. When it came to trims, you had three main ones throughout the life of this generation. Uh, you had the base or the executive series. And then you had the signature. And then sitting up at the top, you had my personal favorite, the Cartier. And you did have special editions thrown throughout there, but um, you had available features like two-tone paint, and, uh, and some of the special editions actually had a vinyl top as well. Coming around the side of the town car, you'll catch a glimpse of 15-inch wheels. You have Ford's awesome uh, touchpad here to unlock the vehicle. You have the most satisfying door handles. Ooh. Unfortunately, this being a used car review, we gotta talk about some of the flaws. One of them, the window regulator is broken, which is a somewhat common issue with these vehicles. A lot of the times though, you'll see these Panther body Lincolns uh, with sagging rear suspension. And that's because this did have an air suspension in the back. These would also break if people forgot to shut the system off when jacking up the car. So make sure that you do that because that was standard on all town cars. And there's a switch actually in the trunk to deactivate it. But moving past these reliability woes, it does look like something that your great grandfather would drive. But I think especially with this as well kept as it is, it really grabs attention. And just like up front, you have a huge trunk lid. So on the outside, you have a classy looking vehicle. And on the inside, you have maybe not the most luxurious experience, but definitely the most cozy. The dashboard here is a really interesting mix of 80s and 90s. It's wide and has that 80s shape, but the plastics and moldings look more time appropriate. Jump back to pre-1995 cars and it's a different story. All years were able to be outfitted in a swanky mid-2000s McDonald's booth red that is fitting for the personality of the town car. From my research, all came with six seats, but the middle front seat is best suited for shorter or skinnier people. The elbow rests are plush like they should be and feel a class above what you would expect from Ford, as do the cool retro looking door straps. You have some really nice feeling switches and then you have some that were pulled straight out of Ford's. The ones right here on the door panel have a really nice click to them. And so does the turning signal switch and you have a really nice satisfying gear lever here and then we have to talk about these seats. They are extremely cushy. I mean, it feels like a really nice leather couch and these have held up pretty well for being 24 years old and this only has 70,000 miles, but they do still feel great. And since you have a bench seat up here, you can sit three wide up front so long as the middle person is someone that you're either familiar with or uh, quite small. 
and I love this steering wheel too, which this car was not detailed at all. This, this was actually sold to a, a local dealership here in the condition that it is in right now. So yeah, it's a little dingy, but everything was really well kept for the most part. The steering wheel has a unique two spoke design that really gives you a different feel down the road since you can actually grab like nine and three and there's nothing in your way. But where this interior starts to fall apart is uh, some of the other switches and stuff. It, it's like half, you know, high class. And then the other half is like Ford Mustang Taurus. Like it really reminds me of my 96 Mustang. The, the head unit here is simple to use, but it doesn't have the most high class look and neither do most of this plastic switch gear, but at the very least it is easy to use and I can tell why uh, older people are usually really fond of these things. There's just not that many gimmicks. There's also no traditional door pockets. Normally they'd be there. They're actually uh, in the elbow rest. And then you have cup holders that come out of here, but you only have two up front, which is a bit of a downer for a car that I would really want to take on long distance road trips. Now when it comes to equipment, this car is just going to have AM, FM, cassette, and four speakers. That's just because it's a bass trim. You actually could get a JBL sound system if you stepped all the way up to the Cartier. And since this car doesn't have the available sunroof, I do have a little bit extra headroom. If we're going to talk size here, you can go a reasonable amount back. If you have someone that's extremely tall, they actually uh, won't fit in the passenger seat quite as good as you might think. That's mainly because this car, again, is body on frame, so there's a frame underneath here. Uh, so the cabin isn't as tall as uh, the, the car's overall height might suggest. Now I'm six foot three. Sitting behind myself, I have more than enough leg room. Uh, and there's a little bit of space here to put my feet underneath the seat if needed. I can also sit back and I have a, you know, an inch or so of headroom. You can really have four or five adults in this thing and they can go on a longer distance journey and be fine. Now you don't have any kind of adjustability, but I do think this has really good support just because uh, this seat sits up a little bit higher than the one in the front. So the thighs are more taken care of and you have the same nice window switches up front uh, with an ashtray, of course, that has a broken door. Which I should mention, the wood in here looks cheap, but doesn't feel super bad. This kind of car new costed uh, around $39,000, $40,000, which it, when adjusted to inflation was $60,000. And while that is a lot cheaper than what a new Audi A8 or Mercedes-Benz S-Class costs, you have to remember, this has nowhere near the amount of features that those cars have, but a lot of people don't really want it. They just want the most comfortable vehicle they can find. And this did a great job of that, even in the trunk. So the trunk of the 1997 Lincoln Town Car is uh, cavernous, as you can see. It is shaped in the weirdest way that I think I could have ever imagined for a sedan it basically drops to the floor, giving you SUV-like space while still offering a spare tire. The only downside is that longer items will not be able to pass through the trunk as the seats don't fold. Another weird quirk to the town car, there's a standard soft close trunk lid. I, I also want to take note, I see so much insulation back here, even like on the back of the seats. And you really feel the benefits of this when you take it out on the road. But before we do that, there's actually one more thing. Uh, there's no trunk release on the inside of here, or at least I can't find it, which means don't shut yourself in here as tempting as it might be. But if you're really trying to elevate your mobster status, I can't see a better way of doing that than with a town car. So now let's take this out for a drive. Driving the town car, especially in 2021, is truly an experience to be felt. It's unlike any modern luxury vehicle, and that's quite obvious. Nobody has made a body on frame car. I mean, honestly, I think since this, at least in the United States, and it makes sense. This handles like if a truck were a car, but it also creates this separation feeling. You're aloof from the road and really all of your worries when you're driving a Lincoln town car. Propelling this anxiety-free machine is a 4.6 liter single overhead cam V8. 
it's commonly called just the two-valve V8 from Ford. Now, this engine debuted for the 1991 model year here in the town car, um, and it was really one of the first applications of this motor. This engine eventually saw its way into the SN95 Mustang, and I actually own one. In this spec, it makes 210 horsepower. Now, getting up to speed, the 4.6 liter engine is well matched for this car, but whenever you first got this, they actually had a carryover from the previous generation. Now, keep in mind, this uh, Panther body platform had been around since 1981 or 1980, um, so this was 10 years old. The engine that was in it was the 4.9 liter, commonly marketed as the 5 liter. That made 150 horsepower. Now, it did have somewhere in the whereabouts of 270 pound-feet of torque, so it was okay for this kind of vehicle, but yeah, no, it was not quick. As it sits with this engine here, um, you don't really have all that much juice. And with 265 pound-feet of torque, passing and highway ramps are not a big deal. It doesn't feel overwhelmed. However, plant the throttle and you'll be more disappointed than the girlfriend of a dude whose personality is his truck. Let me hear you say, truck yeah. After driving it, I understood why Lincoln didn't bother with a tachometer. You don't really want to rev this thing out. They at least do give you this real sly digital speedometer that is still fully functioning to this day. If you are wondering, my car here has 190 horsepower, like all 97 models did to my knowledge. 94 to 96 models all had 210 horsepower because they came with a more free-flowing exhaust, which used to be exclusive on the Cartier. All came with some variant of a four-speed automatic, which works well enough here. The gearing is obviously tall, but it is buttery smooth as you would expect and shifts with little urgency. If you want it to kick down, you have to stomp it with conviction. Now, this is the part where I would do a 0-60 to 60 test. However, an engine light popped up while I was driving this, so I chose not to. Typically, expect a mid 9 second run from a well-kept example. So yeah, straight line speed, not a strong suit of the town car. Neither are corners, really, as you'd probably expect. It's a 4,000 pound car riding on a 1980s structure. The steering is devoid of any life whatsoever, and the suspension kind of just barrels along. You really feel secluded from your surroundings. And over these rough roads, this just floats over everything. You get some of that vertical motion like a truck, but nothing is really making it to my spine. Uh, some of this is due to the seats too. These are really cushy seats. You just have this feeling of confidence when you drive this over pretty much any type of imperfection because you don't feel the consequences. And the rear air suspension actually does keep this reasonably composed for the amount of a body roll that it has. It keeps it from feeling too lofty, but still whenever you go over bumps, you just kind of glide over them modern suspensions aren't designed to handle it like this. But they can still be just as comfortable. Really, old luxury cars, especially American ones, had a different definition of upscale than the new models do. Before I get philosophical, let's talk brakes. These were surprisingly responsive. I was expecting sponginess, but they brought the car to a halt with no drama. ABS was optional in 1990, but standard by 1992. Rear disc brakes were added for 91. For the entirety of the generation, you had dual front airbags, but none on the side. When it comes to the steering, it's about what I was expecting. Yes, it does have some slop on center, but you don't feel any like looseness. It's just slow. You can adjust the steering. You can make it a little bit heavier, or you can have it right now. I have it on the lightest setting just because I'm really trying to get the full experience here, but I've had it on both and you do feel the difference between the two. And I just keep coming back to this. It's an experience more than anything else. The view outward is different from most vehicles. You're sitting on top of a frame, so you're kind of looking down. You have pretty low windows, so visibility is good. You see the ends of the vehicle. I see the hood. I love the Lincoln badge on there. You really feel like you're piloting something and you know where the end of the hood is roughly, which helps for parking, which is a little bit tricky. It requires a lot of three-point turns. Whenever you get up to speed, the, the window regulator here is broken, so the, the window started to droop down slowly. 
but normally when this window is up it is whisper quiet you just hear some wind noise coming in because this thing is shaped like a brick but even that is still a little bit more toned down than what I was expecting now this being a 24 year old car whenever you're on the outside you actually do hear some of the creaking and a little bit of clatter uh, from various parts of the vehicle I don't know what it is but it's a testament though to the insulation because I can't hear hardly anything on the inside of this car. That reminds me, reliability. Engine and transmission failure weren't too prevalent if you performed regular maintenance and kept an eye on the transmission fluid. EGR system issues, window regulators, and cracked intake manifolds resulting in a loss of coolant are somewhat common issues, but failing air suspension compressors due to leaks in the system are the biggest downfall to these. And it's a pricey repair, but none of this is enough to scare me out of one of these. Overall, this is a fair investment for an enthusiast looking for a cruiser, but there's a reason why these cars don't exist anymore. In the past, it was much harder for a large luxury car to handle well than it is now. There were more limits to what a suspension could do. Eventually, luxury automakers began to figure out ways to keep cars reasonably comfortable while gaining composure through windy roads. Chassis and suspension architecture became more calculated. Adaptive suspension became more sophisticated. Engines became more potent. An Audi A8 will handily beat this in every regard outside of trunk space and seating capacity. But this can still hold its own in comfort too. This is a different kind of coddling though. The A8 and all other new Luxo barges are far smoother than this thing. They stay composed through imperfections, whereas this just barrels through rough roads while you pilot it from a living room sofa style seat. Some of you will prefer this. While I would much rather have a less complicated car with supreme comfort, newer luxury vehicles have the hardware and software to give you ultra comfort and a well handling car. Land yachts aren't needed anymore. I love the Lincoln Town Car and what it stands for, you know? it's comfort over everything, but it spawns from an era where luxury cars had to choose comfort or capability. Now they can have both. If you're looking for the most comfort that you can find for 10 grand or under, and you need something that is feasible to upkeep, the second gen Lincoln Town Car earns a huge recommendation from me. Not only does it provide a posh ride, it delivers an experience that will remain exclusive to the past. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell and I'll catch you in the next one.